Hi, I'm State Senator Tony Wong. I am joined today by an absolutely fabulous uh, woman that I know. Uh, her name is Champagne Joy. She also is a stage four metastatic cancer survivor. Um, and she has been a remarkable story of courage, resiliency, and go get them. And so with that said, um, I want to get right into the conversation. Um, we, we hear so much about a cure and, and, and how breast cancer is something with early detection and, and that you can lead to a cure. But stage four, metastatic cancer, that's different, isn't it? Can you right. elaborate a little bit more for me? Yes. Stage four metastatic breast cancer has no cure. So when we talk about it, we look at where research has gone and they do focus on early detection because that's when you can still do something about it. But once you have stage four metastatic breast cancer, you will die from it. There is no cure. Uh, at this point, the hope is to transform it into a chronic disease, but there is no cure. Metastatic means that it has evolved to spreading beyond your breasts to other parts of your body. Absolutely. Through your liver, lymph nodes, and bones, but it is still defined as breast cancer, and that's where the vernacular is, but, but it, it has no cure. That it, is remarkable. It has no cure, and it's not just vernacular. So what happens is when it gets to your liver or your lungs or your brain or your bones, which are the common route it takes, they genomically take samples and look at that tissue and they say, this is breast cancer. I don't care where it is in your person. It's not liver cancer in your liver. It's breast cancer in your liver. So it's one disease that has now spread outside the breast and gone to the rest of your body. And for that, there is no cure. There is no cure, but, but you said something that was encouraging for me. It can be treated as a chronic disease. What do you mean by that? The goal is to stay alive, obviously. Nobody wants to be diagnosed with a terminal illness and just lay down and die. So when they look at the little bit of research that's going specifically into metastatic breast cancer, they look at ways to prolong your life. And that's left the realm of just chemotherapy, single agents that sort of string you along, but for every day you gain, you lose because you're sick from the treatment. They look at immunology. They look at immunology agents that you could have reduce the rate of speed at which your cancer is spreading and growing, and then prolong life. Still no cure, but the goal is to just prolong living because the median death rate of women with metastatic breast cancer at this point is about three years from diagnosis. The five-year rate is dismal. There's like a 1% survival rate past five years. So if you can prolong life, you're still not curing the disease, but you're treating it to live, to live longer. Champagne, I've known you for more than five years. Right. Um, I have always seen you with such energy, resiliency. But I've also had the chance to talk to you when you said, I can't get out of bed. I'm so sick from the treatment that, that I'm going through. Um, tell me, why do you fight so hard? And, and, and we're doing this taping because of your urging and your passion and advocacy. You're not just simply fighting for yourself as you are, but you are a remarkable, Thank you. remarkable example to people fighting and helping others. Well. You've known me for more than five years, but I have not known stage four for more than five years. So what you have to understand is that I am like a third of every breast cancer patient base, which is that I started at a lower stage. Hmm. I started at stage three. I went through standard treatment. And then after two years of remission, I suddenly had cancer the breast cancer in many parts of my body and was now terminally ill. And what really very few people seem to know is that that happens to a third of all women who are diagnosed with any stage breast cancer. Let me rehash that number again. It's a chilling number that any women exposed or, or 
diagnosed with diagnosed breast cancer. breast cancer, even stage one, right, has a third of a chance. Yes. For it to develop into a incurable stage four. Yes. Mastetic breast cancer. Yes. Yeah, and that's why when we talk about how can you do bottom-up research, where you look at early detection and the efficacy of a better mammogram, and you don't do any top-down research, meaning if everything went towards metastatic research, then you'd be curing everyone. Because at the worst end of the disease, if you can find that cure, then everyone at every stage gets cured. But if you only focus on bottom-up research, we look at stage one, what do you tell that woman when out of 100 women, 33 of those women who went through treatment, they survived. They went on. They had kids. They had a life. And it's a few years later, or a couple years later, or many years later, metastatic, you're going to die. We have no cure. We barely have treatment. We didn't do any research. That's the reality. Why do you think there is that that dearth of, of research commitment, the telling of the story that we're doing right now. Why do you think that, that we, we have been so uninformed? Uh, you know, I talk a lot in the press and in the internet. We've developed sort of a, a huge communication between women across this country who suffer from this disease and don't have a voice. And we focus on why, have, why are we here? How can we change this? And the answer seems to come back again and again that there has been a lot of marketing of early survival, early cancer rates, and sort of a joyous survival being a more acceptable public image that no one wants to think about 19-year-old girls and 23-year-old girls and 30-year-old mothers dropping dead of breast cancer. And there's been a lot of mismarketing, and a lot of it has to do with a gender bias against a predominantly woman's disease. And there is an expectation that we will be celebratory if we survive, and very quiet if we are going to go off and be terminally ill. You're not. <laughs> You're quiet, not quiet. No. no. Um, and you could very easily focus on taking care of yourself and, 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 and spending the time that you have. But that's what I said earlier. You are remarkably courageous. You are an inspiration and motivate so many people to not only care for themselves, but to care for others. And I think that's what's so important about this is that we need to shine a light. We need to raise awareness. We need to let people know that the compelling number of where nearly one-third of any breast cancer survivor has a, a chance to develop metastatic breast cancer. Now, that number is even more poignant in the state of Connecticut. Yes. Can you tell me that our numbers in Connecticut are even more? Yes. So, you know, what they have done some research about is where and who gets affected more predominantly by breast cancer in general, not even mm -hmm. metastatic breast cancer, just breast cancer. So the national average of breast cancer in this country is that one in eight women will get the disease. That could be at any stage. In the state of Connecticut, within Fairfield County, you have the second highest rate of breast cancer in this country, second only to Marin County, California. One in three women in this area get breast cancer. I meet women every day because I'm out there advocating. As you said, I don't just do this for me, I do this for a lot of people. And I meet women every day who say, I'm just waiting for my turn. I know it's going to happen. I know the great, greatest breast care center is down the street because they live in Fairfield, Connecticut, or in Trumbull. And, but they know their turn is coming. And they have daughters, and they move because it's not safe here. The rate is so predominantly higher that it's terrifying. Connecticut has the fourth highest incidence of breast cancer in the country. But you are sharing with me that we have, as a county in Fairfield, have the second highest number of breast cancer 
second only to Marin County, north of San Francisco. Correct. And what you're saying to me is one in three women will be diagnosed in Fairfield with County cancer. will be diagnosed. How is that not a health care Emergency. Oh, uh, emergency <laughs> yes. alarm. Yes, that's my question to you. As you're asking me, I'm asking you. So we're on the same page. The problem is there's a problem, and it's not been acknowledged. It's been documented that it exists, but it has not been dealt with. You know, you need people to come into the place and say, what is different about this environment or this water or this air or something that jacks the rate up so much higher than everywhere else. Well, I, I, I want to thank you for, for raising this awareness, for, for, for shocking me in regards to these numbers, and, 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 and reminding me that we have a lot of work to do to raise these awareness. But I want to take a step back and talk about your initiative in us doing this today. We talked. You were going to get some testing done at, and I'm going to say it, the Norman Freeman Breast Care Center. Yes. A fabulous organization. Amazing. That, that, that takes people in regardless of income, and they, they, they care deeply. Yes. But you told me we needed to wait because the, 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 the treatment was so debilitating and that you literally would not be able to do anything right. for a week and a half, and that you have to build yourself up to do this, and that you were, were just putting yourself and getting yourself all the energy and all the positives that you have to do something like this. How amazing is that? Can you share with me what you had to go through to be here in front of the camera to just share the message that we're just about to share that's so important. It's remarkable. I, I don't think of you myself, rock. thank you. I don't think of myself as amazing. I think of myself as one of a million women that are doing this, that go through treatment forever because we have metastatic breast cancer. There's no end of chemo, there's no end of treatment. You cycle from one drug to the next drug. And as it stops working, because the treatment stops working, you go to the next drug. The next drug's always harsher than the last drug. And I don't think of myself as a hero. Um, I think of myself as this is my job. My job is to do whatever it takes to stay alive as long as possible so that other women don't have to do this. It's about, hopefully, my nieces maybe their children, but hopefully in the next few years, the clock will start ticking on cure. It won't happen for me. But if I can leave this earth knowing that I did get out of bed and I did come here when I didn't feel like I could, and I had to boost my white count and I had to do all those things to try to get here, and it, it's that important to me that I know that the secret got out that women are sick and women are dying, and that if you imagine a world without women, you'll stop looking at them as second-class citizens who don't deserve cure, and that we must research. We have to know why it's happening more here and more in certain other places, and we have to find a cure. It's simple. I got out of bed because we're dying. People are going to look at this and they say, what energy, what, what, what a personality. But I've also talked to you when you've been so down. Sure. And exhausted. Yes. And, and lying in bed and just, just not being champagne. <laughs> and I, I know your husband, Michael, who is an inspiration as well. Yes. Um, Tell, tell the people how bad you feel sometimes and, and how, how you find the, the will, how you find the, the capability to, to be champagne. You're larger than life. 
you know, what happens when they tell you you're going to die is you stop thinking of money as the commodity. You start thinking of time as the commodity. So you say, OK, money has no value. I could win the mega lottery today. It won't make a difference. I'm still going to die. What do I have? I have time. So what am I going to do with that time? Am I just going to grab a guy and go to Tahiti and say, you know, forget everyone else? Or what are my priorities? So I am luckily in touch with a network of women all across this country who have made their end of life choices to be the same priority of hashtagging our way to cure and talking to legislators and going to Capitol Hill in October and doing everything they have to do to get the secret to stop being a secret. And I look at my time and I say, OK, this is how much of my time is going to be spent in bed, retching, sick, miserable, and that fluctuates. And then I have my time with my friends, my family, my husband especially. And then there's cancer land. There's these women who are alone. We talked about this, right? We, I said, I can only do this because what lifts me are my people. And there are women out there who do this alone. I get the call from the internet. I'm alone. They don't have Norma Freeman Breast Care Center. They don't have medical benefits. They don't have information. And they don't have a network of people. They're just alone with a terrible diagnosis. And they say to me, what can I do? And I say, we're going to help you. You're not alone. You're not useless. We're all going to lift you up. You're a great example of that lift up. Um, but talk to me about cancer land. And, and for those people that you talked about that sorely needs a lift, sorely needs to know that they're not alone. And, and, and what, what does cancer land do? So cancer Other than yeah. a group of fabulous, fabulous women with a lot of pizzazz and personality, but you all share a common connection. Yes, we all have breast cancer. And what we do is we help other women with breast cancer. So a lot of what Cancerland does is our focus is getting the people the help they need. So that may mean clean your house while you're at treatment. That may mean watch your kids while you're at treatment. That may mean drive you to treatment or get you pay for your cab to treatment. We do that. And then with our free time, we focus on metastatic research being a priority and getting that message out and supporting women who have no resources. And we give lots of unsolicited advice about what the real side effects are of certain drugs and what you're really going to need to get through this. Anybody watching this, how do they get a hold of Cancer Land? Oh, well, we're easy to find. So uh, we're very popular. We have a website, which is cancerland.tv. We have a Facebook page. and. Uh, we accept, we're like the A-team. If you can find us, we'll help you. So people reach out, and they're welcome to do so. And some people just say, you know, we get a lot of husbands and mother-in-laws who send us a note, and they say, my wife was just diagnosed. I don't know what to say. Do I bring flowers? Do I tell her everything's going to be all right? Do I, what do I do? And I say, well, here's eight opinions about what you should say and do. And definitely bring flowers. So, <laughs> what would you want to say to people to just compel them, motivate them, inspire them to take action? I would say that my situation is actually very universal because we're all in that same boat that we're all terminally ill. It's just that we have a very different understanding of when and how we're going to die. But that life is so amazingly precious, and that time is precious, and that we cannot live without our women, we cannot live without our loved ones, and that we all have to do this together. We're human beings. We have to do this. Great job. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for inspiring me oh, to do this Thank as well. you for being there for no, me. No, it's my pleasure. It's mine. Senator Tony Wong and the incomparable <laughs> Champagne Joy.